It's 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and we know what that means, right? We're military, and we start on time. So welcome to the Military Women's Memorial. My name is Phyllis Wilson. I am the president of the Military Women's Memorial Foundation. I'm so honored that you braved the weather and the clouds and the wind to be here with us this afternoon as we launch our first ever health and wellness series program on heart health in the month of February. I want to quickly tell you that I am also uh, not only a military intelligence soldier, I'm a registered nurse. And as we were looking at the ideas of what heart health should be and what we should talk about, it's February. Red dress, heart health, made perfect sense. So we've been planning this for months. So I decided to make it really personal. Almost exactly one month ago, I was standing at a podium in Dothan, Alabama. And as I was speaking and presenting and talking about the Military Women's Memorial and the women of Alabama that have served this nation, I started to feel really warm, which is not me. My hands are always cold. I have thyroid, you know, hypothyroidism. I'm always cold. I was warm. I ended up asking for water. And within three minutes, I collapsed, taking the podium to the floor with me. I was hospitalized for three days. I'm 63 years old, and I had no idea that I had hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy until one month ago. So heart health now has a really important personal reason for me, not to mention that it was during a lunch with beautiful linen tablecloths and about 250 guests staring at me, laying on a stage, <laughs> feeling, one, I knew something was definitely not right, and two, incredibly embarrassed. Thank God the color detail that we had had that day was from the local fire department, and two of those men were EMTs. When I opened my eyes, I had firefighters <laughs> looking at me. It's not the way to meet a guy, I will tell you that. So without further ado, heart health, February, and military women. What is the parallels and how are we going to pull those together? We have some incredible speakers and we have an amazing panel discussion for you this afternoon. We are live streaming it, so hello to all of you that are part of our audience out there in TV land. And we're also recording it. So within a few weeks, we will have a lovely polished video, which we encourage you to share out within your communities as well. Now, none of this could be done without the help of our sponsors. We are a 501c3 foundation, and we rely on the support and generosity of so many great organizations. Let me include who our sponsors for our health and wellness series are. First and foremost, TriWest. Thank you very much for your tremendous support of us. OptumServe, WPS Health Solutions, AARP, Maximus, Humana, and Leonardo DRS. And of course, our community partners, which is the Cohen Clinics, and our community building artworks, which you'll hear more from both of them a little bit later today. So without further ado, I'd like to open with our welcoming keynote remarks from Rear Admiral Tracy Farrell with the US Public Health Services. She is the Principal Deputy Assistant Director Healthcare Administration at the Defense Health Agency. She assists the Assistant Director and the DHA Director in planning, direction, and management of healthcare facilities on implementing policy, procedures, and direction that affect healthcare delivery and administration, and provides cross functional support to the defense health networks and management of the TRICARE health program. Thank you to TRICARE for covering my services one month ago. <laughs> Admiral Farrell is also the director of Defense Health Network Continental, where she oversees all executive management, the clinical operations, the business operations, and strategy for 26 military hospitals and clinics across the United States. Admiral Farrell, please join us on stage. Well, good afternoon, and thank you, Phyllis, for, for that introduction. I did not realize they sent all that information, so um, 
Um, really, truly an honor to be here this afternoon um, and be present uh, at the memorial, uh, specifically for the kickoff, kickoff of this um, health and wellness event. So exciting. Um, I've talked to several of you um, prior to, to coming up here, and, and this is a, the beginning of a series of really health and wellness uh, for, our, for the women uh, that not only serve in government, but in my mind that serve um, in support of everything we do every single day, no matter whether you're in the government or in the civilian sector. So thank you. Also an honor um, to represent uh, DHA and Lieutenant General uh, Toledo Croslin, uh, the DHA director who is halfway across the world. Um, she's actually visiting some MTFs in Guam and Japan as we speak, and she sends her regards. And I can speak on her behalf as, as well as many of you, I'm certain, about heart health um, and how critical it is to women. And, and, and some of the probably misperceptions of, of heart health and who it affects, how it affects them, um, and who is truly at risk for heart health. And when I look in this room, I'm quite certain each one of us, if not personally, Phyllis, that's been affected by heart disease, has a close family member that's been affected um, by heart disease. And, and, and I personally, my grandmother and my mother, both um, fell prey to heart disease. Um, probably growing up, um, didn't realize at the time that many of those factors uh, and, and life decisions that they made contributed to that heart disease. Um, but as I became more educated in healthcare, I could, I could look back and see what, what lifestyle decisions they made that, made that contributed really to, the, to their heart disease. Um, lost my grandmother to a stroke after various events in her life. Um, my mother, we lost to breast cancer, but treatments that were available to her could not be selected because she also had um, heart disease. And so it limited the available treatments to her. So not a direct contributor to um, her death, but could have been indirectly um, decreased the life expectancy based on um, really what available treatments were for it. And you said something that resonates with me, and I think about this often. Um, so you heard, I, I wear a couple of hats at, at Defense Health Agency. Uh, I am the United States Public Health Service. I am not Navy for anybody out there that has mistaken me for Navy. We do wear similar uniforms. Um, and, and I'm also a clinical pharmacist. Uh, so throughout my career, I have um, really dedicated uh, treatment options uh, in, in underserved areas specifically for heart disease. So um, I'm passionate about that and about women's health. Um, just because of some of the experiences. I have two sisters, I have two daughters who also have given me two granddaughters. I, there's no sons in my, so <laughs> women's health is extremely important. I do have son-in-laws, son but um, we'll, we'll let them take care of themselves. Um, <laughs> but we all know we take care of them, right? Yeah. And that, that's my other comment. Um, while we wear, as women, um, different hats in our professional careers, um, whether you've served in the military, and my colleague Deidre knows this, um, you're asked to fill multiple roles, not just your day job. Um, and as leaders in, in, in government, you have to balance that. But then when you go home, you take those hats off, you put on the hat where you have to take care of your family. So you make specific decisions for your family, health care decisions, healthy life choice decisions, hopefully, or not, um, we're responsible for some of those decisions um, that we make for our families um, and, and educating them um, through what I saw with my grandparents, my parents, I made sure to educate my kids. Um, healthy lifestyle. Screen time was minimum. We had no cable TV. I was the worst mother ever. Um, <laughs> we didn't, and we lived in the country, so that was bad. Um, but they didn't sit in front of the TV. They were active. They were involved. Both of them now are healthcare providers um, and contributing back um, to the healthcare setting, but they're also reaching out into their communities and in their families and providing that um, those 
healthy life choices and making all aware of not only the physical implications of heart disease, but also the mental implications of heart disease. And I've got a mental health provider as one of my daughters, so she makes sure that I um, highlight that. And it, it's very true. Um, and it impacts our physical and mental well-being as women. How we, because we will take care and go above and beyond to take care of others. What we don't do very well is take care of ourselves. We don't do, I mean, we're all things to everybody, but sometimes not ourselves. And so um, that's also something that we need to speak uh, to women, career women, women in the military. Um, I don't know, if we can go to the slide, I wanna, wanna jump to the slide. Um, this is, uh, Lieutenant General Croslin calls this the why slide. Why do we even have a military health system? We have a responsibility. Um, we take care of beneficiaries from infancy to end of life. We, we, we provide care for that whole spectrum. We are consumers of the military health system from uniforms. Our family members as um, dependents also use the military health system. Um, we have women flyers, we have women maintainers, we have women in healthcare. You see women in all facets of military. So why do we have the military health system? Some of you, I would assume most of you are familiar with it, but if not, um, some might think, and I've heard this, but you serve and take care of a very young, healthy population. And they're thinking of the active duty service members, right? And, and yes, I mean, that's one of our primary responsibilities to make sure that they're fit and ready to go out the door at any time for the safety of our nation so that you and I feel safe when we're at home. Um, but um, there are 9.5 million beneficiaries that the military health system provides health care services to. Um, of those in uniform, women comprise just under 20% of that um, formation, if you will. Um, and while they may be young and healthy today, are we making them aware of all of those um, life choices that they make? Um, and I think that's some of the trends that you see. Um, we become aware very late. You said, you know, Lo and behold, I found that I had, and I forgot what the condition was, but it was a, um, it was a negative effect of heart health. In, in a little bit more of your advanced age, not, you're not old, you're not old, because I'm not old, so you can't be old. <laughs> um, um, but as we age, right, our, our body begins to um, decide what wants to work today and what doesn't. We all know that when we wake up. But um, preventive measures... Um, screenings, all of those things are imperative. Um, lifestyle modification and behavior changes, critical. Um, when I think about uh, the perceptions of heart disease, we think, number one, most of society think that's a man's issue. This happens to men. Well, it happens to women, and it's actually the no number one leading cause of death in women, cardiac disease. Um, so no. It doesn't happen to young women, it only happens to older women. Not true either. If you look at the, the data, 75% um, of 20 to 30 year olds have modifiable risk factors that contribute to heart disease. They currently have those factors that over time will contribute to their health declining because of heart disease. That's diabetes, hypertension, um, high cholesterol things that really don't give you symptoms right away. Bad life choices, um, you know, drinking, smoking, um, and then obesity, um, a big contributor uh, to heart disease. Um, so those are some of the trends that you see. Um, minority and women of color have a higher incidence of heart disease. And DOD takes that seriously and, and works with those communities to find the right treatments to approach them. Um, we do all these things in DOD to make sure that the women um, that are serving our military and all of our beneficiaries are cared for. 
Um, so, so many things, so many things, we, and I won't, I don't want to take the time of the panel because I'm as excited as everybody else is to hear that. But when I think about your story, um, I wonder were there some things that could have been identified early in your health career, is what I'll call it, um, that would have indicated that there could have been a problem before the event occurred? Absolutely. Absolutely. So these are trends that concern, but these are also trends that we can change. Really optimistic because um, like the slide that I showed, um, the whys, we, we are required and we take um, pride in delivering health care to our beneficiaries, those that are in uniform, those that support those in uniform as dependents, and those that have served before us, um, that keep us safe every single day. Um, so we do that. But secondly, we're responsible for maintaining their readiness. And that means that we, they are fit to fight. They are ready to walk out the door at a moment's no, notice to defend our nation. And that's a priority of General Crossland and our entire military health system. We take that seriously and personally. Um, and in that readiness portfolio, their family is part of that. If they are walking out the door um, to take care of our nation, they need to be assured that in the military health system there is somebody taking care of their family, that they're getting dependable care, and that they're well cared for and somebody's answering that call in their absence. So we owe that to the families um, so that those folks can remain ready. Um, that's the why. You, I, I talked about the trends. I want to tell you some of the things that um, the Defense Health Agency in the military health system is doing to kind of address some of these. Um, really through advancement efforts and modernization, we're looking at how we can start early, bring care to the patient, instead of, instead of waiting for them to bring their conditions to us. Through technology and advancements, um, we've got efforts underway to really capitalize on some of the industry standards that are out there that will propel our care to our beneficiaries where we're preventing before we have to get them in the, the treatment rooms to treat. And how do we do that? We're looking at the technologies. We're partnering with industry to find out what's working out there, different AIs that we can monitor patients. Um, and, and, and that will go with, with this in particular. There are AIs that we can put on our men and women in, in uniform to track um, behaviors, to monitor heart rhythms, blood pressures, all of those um, risk factors well before they have sequelae for any disease and have what we would consider heart disease. So we're looking at all of those. And we talked to some of our <coughs> local leaders, our retirees, some of the family members to see what what they thought about the care and what we could do to help support um, the health care delivery for the beneficiaries in the military health system. And what they told us was um, decrease the friction of getting us access to care. Show us how we can access that care. How do we get in the door? And I'm not talking about a physical door. It, doesn't ha it might be the, the brick and mortar facility, but how do we increase access through technology, through video chatting, through texting, through uh, um, just a phone call. How do we take the care to the patient? And they're asking for that. Um, how do we get them information in their hands through technology? And we're looking at those items as well to be able to modernize the way that we educate and bring awareness uh, to them. And then we're partnering with industry to understand what's available out there and what's working that we can adopt within the military health system to support wellness and health for all of our military members. And that's exciting to me. That's super exciting to me to see the advancement that we're making at DHA. And we're rolling some of this technology out this year um, and looking to see what works well uh, with our uh, beneficiaries. We're asking them, our beneficiary, our patient, to partner with us to own their health status from a young age to advanced age so that we can prevent heart disease and, and, and all the complications that are associated with that by decreasing the risk factors up front. So we're not in a treatment mode all the time, but we're 
creating awareness, just like these events. We're increasing awareness and providing education through these channels with their doctor, making that connective tissue there, because if we're giving them AI to monitor whatever that is, that's talking to their provider. That's sending messages to their provider and messages back to say, hey, this is what's happening. I recommend you do this. Were you aware of whatever that thing is? And so we're, we are actually rolling some of that um, technology out, and we're super excited. So while there's trends that concern many of us in heart disease, I also see industry, and particularly the military health system, making strides to improve um, the way we deliver health care. We put the patient first. You know, as providers, it's comfortable to have them come to us, um, whatever um, level of clinician you are. It's traditional to have the patient come to us. Well, we feel like there will be better outcomes if we take the care to the patient, we hear the patient, and we monitor it that way. So I'll stop there. Um, I'm tired of hearing my voice. I'm sure you all, there's four fantastic panel members that will be coming up here, and I'm excited to hear them. I want to thank um, the, the, the memorial here for inviting me. Um, the organizers of this, the sponsors of this, really excited to hear um, not only the panel, but my colleague, uh, General Tehan, um, as she uh, closes out this event. Um, I truly want to thank you for um, allowing DHA to be a partner in this, and we'd love to continue that partnership and be involved in some of these health and wellness uh, series. So thank you very much. Look forward to the rest of the event. Wow, that's a good way to start, huh? Let us know that there are some things that we could all be doing better for ourselves, as well as um, there are some things that might just be genetic. But either way, if we don't know about our health conditions and what we can do to impact that, well, that's why we have a panel of experts that are about to come on the stage and give you a little bit more in-depth insight into what we can all do and how health and wellness impacts all of us. So Dr. Sharon Bannister will be our moderator for this lovely panel. Y'all can start on up. And uh, Dr. Bannister is a retired Air Force Major General, a dentist by trade, which has heart health implications, may I say, and, uh, and also is one of our board members here at the Military Women's Memorial. I'm going to allow Dr. Bannister to take over from here. Thank you. I'm going to use this one. I'm going to do be a little different. Can you hear me okay? Excellent. Uh, this is super exciting for me. Um, number one, getting to see my DHA colleagues. Uh, I makes me almost want to put back on the uniform. Almost. <laughs> almost. <laughs> Um, but great words, and you're definitely hopping us into the conversation that really, we really want to have on stage. And I'm going to be a little non-traditional, and you guys know, I, I warned them in advance. I'm going to let the panel, the distinguished panel, introduce themselves and talk a little bit, not only about what their current role is, but a little bit about their history, and then I'm going to give them, I, I always have to throw in an extra one, and that's tell me why this is important to them. And Phyllis got up and did that brilliantly. And just so I don't not play with the crowd, I'll start with me. And it's been interesting because we had lots of little Zoom meetings ahead of time talking, and it, it's true. I think you heard the... Um, uh, First Lady back in November talk about women's women's health and the lack of research and they said everybody knows that one woman who had who had different things happen to them they had no idea and it didn't really look like cardiac it might have looked like cardiac everything's different and they say oh well that's because women are just different they have they have different systems <laughs> it's the number one uh, cause of death in the in the United States and so that's a big deal so I'll share a little so I'm gonna do it you already know who I am and I'm super excited to be here so I just had pinned on my second star I had gotten back up to DC for like my hundredth assignment and I'm sitting in the room and I'm like wow you know I feel kind of different and I went home and I'm like oh I'm sure I'm fine uh, interestingly about 85% of women do not go get seen for symptoms just so you know 
And so I, I went home and went to bed. And then in the middle of the night, I woke up and I said, oh my gosh, something's not right. My husband's like, what do you mean? Something's not right. I go, no, seriously, something's not right. And I sat up and I rolled over and I put seven pillows under, tried to move around to make uh, whatever this was go away. But I was convinced I was having, you know, I, I have pain. I think I have pain in my arm. Oh my gosh, I'm having a heart attack. Uh, you know, am I? That's really bad for somebody that works on the medical staff. So I, I went to the hospital and I can tell hospital stories because it was not a VA and it was not a military health system hospital, but I, I was kind of scared. So you go to the closest one, right? And I went in and I'm not going to give all of the background, but for 15 hours, people tried to fig figure out what was wrong with me. Um, multiple different tests, uh, lots of different people, some providers that are coming in and more seem intrigued because they couldn't figure out what was wrong, and then others who gave you that look and you absolutely, they knew, they thought you were just making it up or maybe you were over-exaggerating something that was going wrong. And trust me, I would not be in the hospital if, if something wasn't really, really wrong. And then that causes frustration. And you sit there and say, I shouldn't have come. Um, but it wasn't cardiac. Uh, I had been on some hormone replacement therapy. Yeah, I'm old. So I am old. <laughs> and and, and uh, I was one of those, what do they say, 0% or 0.11% that end up with a pulmonary embolism. But it took them all day. I was in the ER for 15 hours. And uh, again, just the emotions that went up and down, not knowing, am I dying? Am I, you know, they give you a little bit of morphine and my blood pressure drops down to about 45 over 20. That gets people excited. Oh, maybe there is something wrong, but it's just interesting. And one of my favorite doctors to listen to about women's health is, uh, her name is Stacy Sims, but she said, women are not little men. So when you look at the research that's been done over time, a lot of it, at least, at least the classic research, has been done with male subjects, and that's not bad. It's just the way it is. And so I think we have a real opportunity. We have got an amazing group to talk to today, and I'm going to have them each introduce themselves, and you've got to share some kind of story. I'm going to mix it up because everyone's like, who has to go first? Um, I'll start with Ms. Risa. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> just it just went up. <laughs> I'm Seema Reza. I am the CEO of Community Building Artworks. We're a nonprofit arts organization that got our start in the military health system. So at Walter Reed Army Medical Center way back when, um, where I learned, really, it was a time in my life where my life was in the blender, um, as that sometimes happens. And I learned really clearly that community is essential for both recovery from both emotional and physical injury, and that at the heart of community is communication. The heart of communication is knowing what it is that you contain. So we use writing and art to help people figure out what it is that they contain. Um, but I think that it's really important to consider our medical care teams as part of our community and people who need to know what we contain. Um, and these processes of like figuring out what it is that's happening for us and in all the noise and being able to communicate them to the people around us who need to know. Patients who can advocate for themselves have better outcomes. Um, and my personal story is uh, a few months ago in September, I was at a silent retreat, um, which is like hours of meditation. I didn't realize how much time with myself it would be. <laughs> And in that silence, two and a half hours, I realized something's not right. I should go to a cardiologist. And I'm 43 years old, so it hadn't occurred to me to go to a cardiologist. Um, but it just, I just knew from sitting with myself and thinking about it and listening. And when I came home and went to a cardiologist, I discovered, or they discovered, that my right internal carotid artery is completely occluded. We don't know why, we don't know how, and down the road it would lead to, you know, we, well, we don't know. But being able to, one, listen to yourself, to take that time to find that space, and two, go out there and advocate for yourself, because, you know, they saw me and they're like, oh, huh, I'm humoring you. Um, is, is, is absolutely essential f for women and for people, um, but I think for women it tends to be harder. Thank you. 
Thanks, Seema, and thanks for being brave and sharing your story. I mean, it's not easy. And the more that we got together, we started realizing we all have a connection. You were absolutely right, Admiral Farrell. Everybody knows somebody, if not themselves. I know the excitement is, is building. Let's go with uh, Dr. Heiberger next. I'm, I'm Dr. Lori Heiberger. Uh, I am uh, an internist and psychiatrist by training, so a little bit insane for doing that. Um, but uh, you'll see how that meshes together in this conversation, I think, quite nicely. Um, to me, the two are inseparable um, beyond just saying it. <laughs> it's, it's how I look at, I think, everything. It, it colors everything in the experience. Um, I did work in, um, in VA healthcare for a little over 12 years, did some national work with uh, pharmacy, clinical pharmacy programs, um, uh, oversaw pretty much anything and everything you can think of. <laughs> um, so uh, then I, I joined TriWest Healthcare, and, and since I've been there, I'm, I, I'm now the chief medical officer for our behavioral health division and very proud to be here today, so thank you. Um, I, I'm going to share a couple really brief, quick whys um, that, that lead up here, um, two of them about others, one about myself. So uh, I, I recall being in college and my mother's best friend um, who had, I, I can't recall exactly, but five or six children. Uh, she was a nurse in a, a pediatric hemonc clinic along with my mom and uh, their house burned down and it was Christmas. And they had to relocate into uh, a hotel. Of course, it took a couple of rooms to, to house that family. Um, and that was distressing enough. Um, we got the call that uh, she had passed. And this was, she was quite young at the time. Um, she had one child that was less than a year old. And uh, they had said that her shoulder hurt. So I think of, oh, that aching shoulder. Um, her shoulder had hurt, which there were plenty of reasons to think why her shoulder might hurt, given what had just gone on and uh, a lot of the... Um, the, the work they were trying to do to save what they could from the home. Um, she went into the other room to rest while her husband, who was a healthcare administrator, um, took, took care of the kids. Um, wonderful, wonderful man. And when they went to check on her, she had passed, and it was a heart attack. Second one I'll share is uh, my grandmother. Um, my, my grandfather was um, quite ill, was in the hospital. Uh, my family is from very rural Kansas originally, so... Um, they had a farmhouse out in the country, and it's a bit of a distance to get to the closest health care facility that can take care of those kind of issues. So uh, rather late at night, she's driving herself back home on these rural roads. I, I think they were all still gravel and dirt uh, at that time. Uh, her kids didn't hear back that she had made it to the house, you know, after spending a whole day at the hospital with him. Um, when they went over, they could see through the window she was on the floor. She had made it in, had her keys in her hand, and had passed. Um, and then I'll share for myself, I had an experience during COVID. Um, I, I, I had to go into the hospital. Um, uh, like many women, I have an auto-inflammatory condition. Uh, women have them at a much higher rate than men. Um, I was in the, in the emergency room during COVID, which is exactly where I do not want to be um, for so many reasons. But add to it, I'm extremely immunosuppressed. Um, so that is a scary thing for me to do to, to even take care of myself. Um, they did have to give me an antibiotic, gave it by IV push. Um, my heart rate started dropping. And of course, I'm a physician, I'm looking at the screen and I'm feeling it, but I'm seeing it. And when it hit about 30, I, I was hitting the button quickly trying to get help. And, and I recall as I lost vision, I never lost consciousness, but um, it did go down to 20. Um, and I recall a very irritated physician voice <laughs> saying to me, well, could you just open your eyes, you know, and take a couple deep breaths? And, and I was thinking to myself, like, I, I didn't come in for this. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't bring this here, and I certainly don't want it, um, and, and I'm a little freaked out. So I'm sure I did look anxious and uncomfortable, but that was the most clear-cut thing that was related. It's a known side effect to that particular medication when it's IV push, um, and yet somehow it was about me and, and anxiety. So I'll leave, that, I'll leave that there. We all have the story. <laughs> all right, Ms. Tickelow. 
My name is Lourdes Siglau. I'm the Executive Director for the Center for Women Veterans at the Department of Veterans Affairs. Uh, I came into the, this position in 2021, so um, aside from my military career, this is my only other government job so far. Everything else has been with uh, disaster response with Team Rubicon, um, doing humanitarian work, and then Airbnb, uh, doing their global partnerships. And I say all this because um, you... And then when I was in the military, I served almost 12 years doing medical evacuations, critical care air transports from Air Force. So you'll see kind of a trend of like a little bit of an adrenaline junkie um, coming through. Uh, and so, you know, what the Center for Women Veterans does, we advocate for equitable access and outcomes for women veterans across, um, not only here in the United States, but across the world, wherever our women veterans are. There's a lot of male vet spouses that are living in different countries. So we want to make sure that we're not forgetting about them. Um, we collaborate across the enterprise and the administrations to make sure that women veterans are at the forefront of some of the things that they're doing with women veterans being the fastest growing demographic within the veteran population. Um, so that's like the spiel. Um, a little bit of the personal story. Um, so I was, I think, 12-ish years old. Um, I came here to the United States when I was 10, but my mom and my oldest sister didn't come here uh, because they were um, older than 21. Um, and when I was 12 years old, they got into a car accident. My older sister survived, but my mother did not make it. And um, same car, same accident. But part of the reason that she didn't make it was because of complications. And part of those complications was... Um, due to our health and, you know, our, uh, as other uh, pro providers are going to say, you know, there's a lot of contributing factors to heart um, health, but, you know, she was diabetic, she was hypertensive, and she also had obesity. So all of these things were contributing factors to her not being able to get through their hos her hospital stay. So in the end, I, we lost her that year. So this kind of hits home um, a little closer, um, so, and, and, you know, like when I'm looking at my family because of all of this, I'm looking at like, you know, what are you guys doing? And also, I'm also much more mindful of the people that are around me and the women, the women veterans that I encounter because it's not always that direct effect. Sometimes it is that indirect effect that causes um, you to, you know, either survive or not. Thanks for sharing. All right, Dr. Stahl, you knew it was going to come. One, yes. <laughs> Last, so um, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, many thanks to the Military Women's Memorial for the opportunity to participate in today's discussion. It's uh, it's really exciting and ready of uh, you know feel very grateful to be able to be part of such a good discussion. Um, I am Andrea Stahl. Uh, I am a 30-year Army veteran. Um, I started out my Army career in ground ambulance, uh, so, um, but then was able to take advantage of a fantastic Army program uh, called Long-Term Health Education and Training, uh, and the Army was set, sent me back to, uh, to graduate school where I got a, a, an advanced degree, um, and so spent the majority of my career working in medical research for the military, um, and uh, most of that was done up in Fort Detrick, Maryland and spent a uh, number of years supporting the chemical, biological, and radiological medical defense program. Um, I retired in 2018 uh, and then uh, joined the Henry M. Jackson Foundation for the Advancement of Military Medicine. Uh, and the Jackson Foundation uh, proudly supports the Uniformed Services University uh, and other uh, military research efforts. Uh, and so uh, my current position is as a vice president for uh, at HDF for USU operations. And uh, HDF has a team of over 1,400 folks who support military medical research uh, at the university. Um, I, I really don't have an exciting story to share. Um, I guess I'm, I'm very fortunate in that regard. Um, but like all of you, I do have a heart. Um, and so um, I'm very concerned about keeping that heart as healthy as possible. Um, and, and also, like many of you, I, I, I have a mom. Uh, I have uh, a sister, uh, I have two daughters, and I have many, many, many wonderful women friends, and um, their health and their well-being and, and their, uh, the, the, their heart health is, of course, very important. And so I'd like to say thank you again uh, to the Military Women's Memorial for not only recognizing the importance of heart health, uh, but for also implementing uh, this series. I, I think it's a, a great initiative um, and really happy and proud to be part of this today. Thank you. 
The reason I had people introduce themselves is because I think it's important to hear their stories. We're not here because, well, we would have been here if Phyllis told us to come. She, <laughs> she, she gets us places, but it's, it's because we really care. And we're going to try to concentrate on heart health, but I think you've already heard the conversation. This is connected, and oh, by the way, this is the first part of a series, so come back for the rest of it. Um, but we are going to go ahead and start with our panel, and I am going to start with Andrea. And the question I have, we already said that... Uh, Cardiovascular disease is the number one cause of death for women in the United States. And yet a lot of that classic research is focused on research that has done with male subjects. What are you doing and what is a Uniform Service University doing in terms of research to try to fill that gap? So that's a great question, and, and uh, I'd like to first start by, uh, for those of you who may not be familiar with the Uniformed Services University, uh, let you know that it is the military's medical school, um, and every year uh, they're graduating roughly 170 uh, medical officers who are going into the military health system and then providing care to warfighters and, and other military beneficiaries. Uh, and so it's a wonderful organization, and like all uh, amazing medical schools, they have a really robust research program uh, and their research programs span uh, the gamut. Uh, they are focused primarily on warfighter health, uh, but look at, uh, for example, anything from combat casualty care, uh, wounds that, uh, that uh, warfighters may experience uh, in combat, to infectious diseases on the battlefield, uh, to uh, military traumatic brain injury, uh, to health and wellness, uh, to resilience, uh, to nutrition, uh, and a variety of other, uh, other areas of research. Um, the Jackson Foundation uh, is very proud to be able to support a lot of the research that goes on uh, at, uh, at USU. Uh, and I wanted to highlight just a few of the research projects um, that are ongoing uh, at the university. Um, the first that I'll highlight is uh, an initiative that's led by Dr. Tracy Comos, uh, who's one of the prominent investigators at the university. Uh, and Dr. Comos has pioneered um, the use of the military health system data repository uh, to uh, look at uh, factors that are impacting the health of active duty service women, uh, and then also to look at ways that active duty service women uh, can better leverage uh, the military health system uh, and achieve health equity. Um, she, uh, Dr. Comos, leads the Center for um, uh, Research Science, uh, Center for Health Research and Sciences, um, and in mining uh, the uh, data repository is looking at a number of factors impacting women's health uh, to include many of those that uh, have an impact on cardiac health, for example, hormonal replacement therapy. therapy. Um, other work uh, being uh, done by uh, Dr. Mark Hagney, who is a cardiologist uh, at USU, uh, includes looking at this very interesting relationship between um, binge eating and the development of preeclampsia and preg pregnancy. Uh, and so, um, interestingly, um, there is a higher incidence of both binge eating during pregnancy as well as preeclampsia um, in military women. Um, I don't think that that is very well understood. Um, and in fact, preeclampsia itself is not particularly well understood, although I would defer to Dr. Heiberger on all of that. Um, but, um, and, and preeclampsia, of course, very uh, dangerous uh, syndrome that can develop during pregnancy um, and leading to increased blood pressure as well as protein in the urine. Uh, and um, with preeclampsia comes a lifelong risk of increased cardiovascular disease. Uh, okay, so it's, it's, it's uh, very significant. Um, and so the work that Dr. Hegney and his team are doing uh, are looking at uh, identifying if uh, binge eating, how binge eating may be correlated with the development of preeclampsia. And so their work uh, suggests that binge eating may be one of those factors that can be a variable in the, de in the development of preeclampsia, but also suggests that this may be something that physicians should be screening pregnant women for uh, this behavior um, during pregnancy. Uh, Dr. Hegney uh, and Dr. Marion Chernofsky Kraft are also working on other uh, studies that are looking at loss of control eating uh, and um, the relationship between loss of control eating and mental and physical stress uh, in young women. 
Uh, and so also, and then investigating different cognitive manipulations that can be done to reduce those behaviors. And of course, the loss of control eating uh, can lead to a variety uh, of different uh, cardiovascular disease threats. Uh, and kind of goes back to what Admiral Ferris had mentioned about lifestyle chase choices and how we can perhaps help women make good lifestyle choices. Um, and then I'll just uh, I'll quickly conclude um, by saying, obviously, a whole lot more research can be done. Um, and uh, one of the exciting things that's happening is uh, Dr. Lynette Hamlin, who is from the USU Graduate School of Nursing, is leading uh, a new program, the Military Women's Health Research Program, uh, that's already funding some great research at the university uh, in a variety of different types of women's health issues to include breast cancer. Um, and uh, she's also participating in the White House initiative uh, that President Biden launched. Um, and I, I will just put a plug in too, I don't know, maybe some of you have seen um, one of the first deliverables for the White House initiative is a hundred million dollar uh, award that the uh, Advanced Research Projects Agency for Health in their sprint for women's health uh, is going to be distributing. And so they're looking for great innovative research uh, that can address gaps in women's health. So, thank you. No, that was fantastic. And again, I, I'm so glad you brought up the initiative because I think that helps. I, I mean, you have the foundation, but another 100 million towards that same effort is, is going to be amazing. And she just announced that last Wednesday. So it's super exciting that she's actually secured the money. An initiative is an initiative until you get money. <laughs> so really exciting. Um, but you did bring up an interesting point, and it's come up a couple times. And the next question is really for Dr. Heiberger, and that's we talk about the physical aspect of heart health, but what about the mental aspect? Because you've got that you know, yeah. behavioral health background. My wheelhouse. <laughs> yes, exactly. So if you could share a little sure. bit about that, that'd be great. Sure. So there's a couple of things to consider um, when, when you're looking at heart health, and this is across genders. Um, so when you have things like depression or anxiety, uh, whether you're fully treating it or not, uh, it, it is a risk factor that plays into how your system uh, is uh, dealing with cardiovascular disease, things like atherosclerosis. Um, it may affect your lifestyle decisions. It, it may affect some of those social determinants of health that, that you know, impact um, outcomes. And, and so knowing, especially when I used to do, uh, as a hospitalist, I would do consult work, and I would flip hats, and I would put on the psychiatry hat. Uh, and so post-stroke or post-MI, myocardial infarction, um, I would come in and do an assessment on anyone that our group had as a, a patient in the hospital. And the reasoning for that was that at the time we had discovered really that the biggest predictor of death six months later from having had a heart attack or a major stroke event was actually if you had depression or anxiety. It wasn't the degree to which you had the heart attack. It wasn't how much your heart failure uh, occurred. It, it, it was amazing to see that um, you know, actually in writing from a study, um, that that's really what makes a huge difference in how you do going forward. Now, we could talk about the different things that might be kind of mixed up into that, but does it really matter? I mean, the, the reality is there is a commingling there, um, some of it biological, probably some of it um, just affecting like your psychological coping with that, how much you're, you're trying to now manage work, family, and this new condition that you're trying to recover from on top of it, uh, it, it all gets enmeshed together. The, the other thing I'll bring up is that, as I mentioned, auto-inflammatory, autoimmune disorders are more common in women than men. When you have those conditions, you have a higher risk of cardiovascular disease. You have a higher risk of atherosclerosis. Um, so it, it's, again, something that women may be battling with, um, you know, around these other conditions. And with those auto-inflammatory and autoimmune disorders, guess what happens? You struggle a little bit more with mental health conditions. So um, depression is, is common, you know, with, with those comorbidities. And so trying to separate the two and address a person with just one of those pieces is a challenge. Um, it, it really doesn't set them up fully for success. Um, and that's across the genders. Um, then when you look at women in the picture of that and, and the fact that some of their medical conditions are a little more 
um, likely to be in this autoimmune, autoinflammatory realm, now you're, you're putting a whole nother level on top of it that you have to address or you're, you're gonna have a bad outcome for that woman. So I think it's, it's something that for me, I love doing the dual training <laughs> where I have the opportunity, where I'm practicing medicine that I can bring those two together and have that conversation with a woman in that way. I think it's very meaningful. I think it, it, it makes sense. I see heads nodding in here, you know, so I, it, it's, this is not revelational. It's just how often does that conversation actually happen together? You know, how often do I as a patient, and believe me, my physicians know I'm a physician, how often do I get that conversation? Zip. It hasn't happened. Um, so it's, it's difficult to get the best information, the best um, guidance as a woman sometimes with the healthcare systems because that full picture that you really need to have together um, isn't always there. And that's, that's sort of my experience with the, the heart rate of 20 and somebody saying, well, would you just open your eyes? And, <laughs> and I'm thinking, I'm just trying not to pass out. I'm trying to focus here, tune everybody out and just stay alive right now, you know, and, and, and just the way that it gets looked at sometimes, it's just a little bit different um, and not always the most helpful. Yeah, I, I just wanted to comment a little bit. I, one, I love that you have that mix because for the longest time, we, I think as a society, even have struggled in integrating mental health to physical health. When you think medical, it's like, oh, it's the physiological side. If it's mental, it's like different. And trying to get that mental health is medical health. It is has been a slog and a slow roll within our society to get accepted. So I love that perspective. And then thinking about um, those, so you talked about depression, but what about those who are suffering from post-traumatic stress, who are always vigilant, who are always um, very alert and um, cannot get their, um, their heart rates down because they're always in that fight or flight um, mode. And so that also has an effect in our physical health and it manifests in various ways cardiovascularly. And so I, I think that that's one of the reasons that the VA is real, part of the reason that the VA has really tried to look at um, bolstering and supporting the mental health side of our veterans, not only from a suicide prevention aspect, but also from the whole wellness. Um, whole health, wellness, holistic health um, aspect, making sure that we are caring for our veterans entirely. Let me add on to that just real quick because I, I, I like that you did bring that in. Um, in terms of the PTSD for women, there's two ways I see this coming up as really critical. Um, and, and this is whether it's related to any military service or, or not. Um, one is, yes, there's that cortisol going all the time. You just, it, it's, it's constant, and that is not healthy. You want to talk about mid-body weight gain and uh, blood pressures going up. I, I used to joke a little bit that when I was in the VA and I was working like urgent, urgent care walk-in and mental health, I could look at the vital signs before I took the patient back, and I could almost tell right away if they were going to have PTSD or not. And it was because you would see these spiking blood pressures and these spiking heart rates, and and there was no good explanation. They were usually on three to four different antihypertensives, and uh, you know whether you know fully compliant with their meds or not, it didn't matter. It was just spiking, you know, over and over again. That's not healthy. That's not good on your body. It's not good on your brain, and and when you consider that. In addition to that, so many women ha have come to the military with a prior trauma. They've already been living this way for a decade or more. And then on top of it, they've learned because of some, some life circumstances, sometimes family relationships, not the best of situations, to tune themselves out and to not check in. And that gets to what you were saying, you know, if we learn too much to not check in with ourselves and not pay attention, this at a younger age can hit somebody. Before you know it, you've lost them. So it's, it's critical. Yeah, it's an intriguing connection. And, you know, Seema, that's one reason that we think it's important that you're here. When you look, and we've had the conversation about that loneliness that, that impacts your health in so many ways, and what are those creative ways that you can kind of work with people to help them get their voice, to talk. Because I think a lot of times when we're talking about that depression or that loneliness, it's an 
inability to have anybody to talk to about things that are problematic. It might be that you're too busy. You're working super hard all day long. You come home and all the expectations are there. And who takes last place? It, it, it's you. So, Seema, I'd love your perspective. Yeah, and the, the thing about loneliness and PTSD are that they cause more loneliness, right? So if you have chronic loneliness happening, you, in fact, then perceive more threat in social situations, which then makes it harder for you to reach out again and connect. Um, and so what, what we've found, we, we have a fantastic program called More Than One Story that actually started here at the Women's Memorial, um, which is a suicide prevention program for women and non-binary veterans. And what we have found is that when you practice saying the hardest things first to yourself and then to a closed group. You can take those stories that are standing as a barrier between yourself and the people around you, right? The reasons why we're weird and feel like, oh, maybe, maybe no one will accept me. You can find the words in the safety of your own space and then use that writing or art to relate to somebody, right? So there's just a little less risk instead of going back into a difficult memory, you go back into what you've created. Um, and then you practice it with the group of people who have shown up and are willing to be vulnerable. Um, and then you can take it to the people in your lives who you, you need to form or reform, in many cases, um, deeper, more authentic connection with. So I think there's just this huge opportunity. If we give it to ourselves, you know, to solve the problem, together as a community. Yeah, and Lourdes, you're gonna kill me. I'm gonna go a little out of, <laughs> out of order, but this is so important because this is all about finding your voice. And first of all, I'll just share. So I, I am old and I now am eligible for care both at TRICARE and the VA. But, but I'll tell you, I, I, I did have some huge misconceptions about what the VA is or what, what it offered. And we've talked a little bit about the DHA. I mean, I've almost my whole career has been in the military health system, and so I, I didn't know what I was getting into. But I've got to tell you, the work that you've done in women's health has just been spectacular because I did feel like I had a voice. And that was unusual because I have had some in in and out uh, appointments and part of it's on me you know oh gosh i got to get my annual exam I, can can you do that in like 7 minutes cuz i've got somewhere to be um so some is me it's not i'm not blaming it on a system and maybe it's because now i'm retired and i actually have time to ask questions of my providers but i had a misconception and so i know you're doing a ton can you talk a little bit about that finding your voice cuz i'm really excited about that initiative oh so, well, a couple of things. Um, one, thank you so much for using VA. Um, and also, I'll, I'll make sure to let Dr. Haskell know she's the chief officer for um, the Office of Women's Health that they're doing a phenomenal job. Um, so, the we're talking about the I Am campaign, right? Yeah, yeah all right. <laughs> Just making sure, because we've got a couple of things going. Um, so there is a, a campaign that we're going to be launching during Women's History Month, which is called the I Am Campaign. And uh, a big part of the, one of the biggest hurdles that we found with trying to find women veterans is getting them to, number one, self-identify. Huge. There's over 2 million women veterans in this nation and around the world. How many are using VA health care? About six to 700,000. In... Um, and, you know, everyone in the military is more of their stories are women veterans. But in the Veterans History Project in the Library of Congress, it's over 100,000. There's only about seven to 8,000 that are women. And so getting women to tell their stories is really hard if they don't, number one, self-identify. So the I Am campaign is kind of like one of our attempts in, uh, to answer that thing of, like, why are women veterans not self-identifying? And one part of that is actually about... Um, the, what's called institutional betrayal. If they suffered a trauma or a really negative experience while they were in the military, they lose that trust in institutions. And they look at VA as just a continuum of that institution. And so they won't come to VA because they think oh, it's just more of the same. They won't come, they won't listen to us because of the same thing. And then there's a lot of stories and misconceptions out there about VA that 
um, it, you know, definitely some of them, you know, they can use some help, but there's a lot more that are actually doing a phenomenal job, like a phenomenal job, just like what you're saying. So the I Am campaign is really about making sure that we bring back agency to women veterans to find their voice. So if I can have you guys just picture, right? Uh, just a portrait, not, so if you guys are familiar with the I Am Not Invisible campaign, it's in black and white. So this campaign is gonna be actually in full color, and there's gonna be several reasons for this. Um, so full color, portrait of uh, a photo of a woman veteran, right? And then the first line is gonna be in block letters I Am, and then there's a line. And on that line, they're going to add the most positive adjective that they have for themselves. Actually, I'll ask, Women veterans out there, just shout it out. Positive adjective, the most positive one you can say about yourself. Great. So put all of those, like one of those words, onto that line. It'll be in handwriting. Um, and then the next block letter is I am a veteran. And part of that reason is to bring that positive association to that veteran status. It's a little bit of a psychological nudge, but it gives agency. The, the VA is not trying to tell you what you are. You're telling us who you are, and we're acknowledging you. And then the last three parts, there's like smaller letters, and they're nouns, and they can be like, I'm like daughter, teacher, healthcare worker, whatever that is. But it, the reason for those nouns is the different hats that women veterans have in their lives, whether it's in their personal life or whether it's in their career. And so the reason that the whole the campaign is gonna be in full color is because we're trying to encapsulate women in their whole multidimensional identity. Not in black and white, we're not in two dimensions. We are multidimensional, we have wear many hats, and we can be those and be a veteran. And you can have a positive outlook on that because of that veteran, because of that military experience. All of those experiences make you who you are and you should be proud of it. And that's probably one of my messages for any woman veteran out there. Yeah, thanks. I was so excited to hear about that. And I said, hey, I wanna, I wanna play. <laughs> I'll be in a picture, I'll wear something bright. Um, although I always end up in Air Force Blue and I would say, Lourdes, so did you. Um, but Lourdes, what else though? You're doing a lot of things to look at outcomes, of health outcomes for women veterans. Do you wanna talk a little bit about some of your initiatives that you're working there? So I don't wanna um, definitely talk, I mean, like step on Dr. Haskell's toes. So uh, I can talk a little bit about some of the advances that VA has been doing for women veterans though. Um, a big part of it, I talked a little bit about the mental health aspect of uh, just medical health in general. And part of the reason for that is um, I was just at the DAV uh, rollout event yesterday with regard to their journey to mental wellness. And one of the things that they saw was a 221% increase in women veterans suicide in 2021. And that's against the civilian women versus the men, 55, or no, sorry, 63%, I think, of uh, veteran men versus the civilian counterparts. And so mental health is a huge, huge issue about this. And so one of the things that uh, VA is really leaning into is in bolstering the support for a mental health outcome, mental health. And so we have the Sergeant uh, Fox Suicide Prevention um, Grant Program. We have the Maternal Mental Health um, Program that we've uh, started pioneering over in VA. And part of it is about, you know, we always look at maternal care from a medical perspective, but maternal mental health actually isn't always talked about. And so I'm actually part of the Maternal Mental Health Task Force with the White House, um, looking at some of these um, aspects and how can we better integrate in community care? Because again, women veterans won't always come to VA. So how do we ensure that we are sharing not only best practices, but how do we get those agencies in the communities to bring back women veterans into the VA? Because not only do we provide healthcare, it's a huge misconception. We do a lot of other things. Um, so like you know, GI Bill, home loans, things like that. Um, and so uh, like the big misconception is we're only healthcare and we're not. Um, the other thing that I wanted to highlight as well is that we have the, um, what's called the PREPARE program, which is 
for perinatal care. So for women veterans, one of the things that we have started doing, and this was started in the Orlando VA, and they're starting to like look at the rollout, but providing more education and care and support for women who are going to be giving birth. And then the last thing that um, I'm gonna highlight is the, we're talking about, you know, aging women, right? There's also the Thrive Program. We're just looking at it from the other side of the, um, the age spectrum. And so we're in VA, we're really looking at the, the larger picture and the continuum of care from the time that you take off your uniform and maybe actually before that, um, especially when we're talking about women veterans, or sorry, service women who've experienced trauma, they can actually access vet centers while they're in uniform. You don't have to be a veteran. For those who didn't know, now you know. Yeah, and, and I really wanted to get a feel from all of these on where we fit in. And some people will say, wait, we, sometimes we weren't talking about heart. It's connected. It really is. The body is connected. The, the heart <laughs> hits the blood that goes all around, and you can, you can connect almost anything. But I think that the real takeaway for me is just that connection with the physical and the mental heart health. Uh, that was a real aha moment for me. And I will say, I'm going to put in a shameless plug. I've already gotten my, hey, you've got 20 minutes left uh, note. But um, we've got amazing tables here today. And so when we're talking about this whole health, there's actually a VA whole health table. Um, when we're talking about the art and the expre the artistic expression that helps you find your voice. We obviously have your booth, Seema, but we also have a yoga. Um, I'm looking for my yoga. There she is. Um, our, we have our veterans yoga table out there. You, you've got to understand that when we're sitting here, and I'm going to charge you guys in a second with a, a little wrap up, but you know, what can we do? I mean, we talked a little bit, definitely Admiral Farrell did about, okay, you've got to go in, you've got to be seen, you've got to have a voice. Um, we have to eat right. We have to look at those things that we actually can help. But then we all think we know everything, and then you, you know, they grab your uterus, and then all of a sudden, guess what? You're different. And so you, all of the things that you thought were true about you as a person now change in terms of your risk factors for cardiovascular disease. So you've got to understand that what we're going to tell you at the age 29 to our person who's getting married soon. Yeah, the two. <laughs> but what we tell our 29-year-old patient better be different than what you tell the 57, almost 58-year-old patient because we change over our lifetime. We're, we're very complex. Women are very complex. <laughs> um, so what I'm going to do, because we are getting to the time where I'm going to get kicked off the stage. I'm seeing everybody looking at their watches and walking around. Um, but what I'm going to do, I'm going to give each of you two minutes and to wrap up. And what I really want to do is for both the people online and the people on the room, if you had one charge that you were going to give people regarding heart health, what would it be? And we'll go right down the line. So I'm going to go with you first. I, I'm just going to, uh, I think, repeat a theme that I've heard over and over again. And I think that ha I have seen that works uh, is advocate for yourself. Um, and I think as uh, women who are mothers, it's really important that we do that because we're modeling that behavior for our own children. When we put ourselves last, um, you know, and, and, and I'm, every woman I think is guilty of that, right? My daughters are watching um, and they're learning that lesson and, you know, and hopefully they are stronger women than I am and they can advocate for themselves uh, in ways that keep them healthy, keep their families healthy. Uh, so I think events like this are fantastic. Um, we have to bind together as a community. We have to support each other. Um, but at the end of the day, you have to advocate for yourself. So, um, and do medical research. So thanks very much. Okay, I, I'm going to say language matters. So um, I, I, in medical school, I think my class, uh, which I, I completed in 1997, I was about 51% female. Pretty good. Um, I catch myself all the time thinking, oh, these symptoms are different for women. Language matters. Women are women. They're not different from men. They're women. <laughs> um, and so when you educate and when you, you teach healthcare providers, because I'll tell you, as a female provider, I am guilty of the same. I have a mentality that the way I learned was based so much off of research on men that there wasn't a strong 
denominator, a strong base of women in that. And so everything was communicated as, and here's how it's different for women. So my hope is that as we are training others, as we are interacting with others, that we speak less about what's different and talk more about this is what it's like for women, this is what it's like for men, uh, this is what it's like for any other ethnicity. I mean, we need to get to that point rather than saying this is what's different as if there is a standard mm -hmm. other than ourselves. So. Thanks. Um, I would say um, loneliness is having less or less deep social connection than you would like. It is different for every person. And so checking in with what you need, um, you know, social connection is as important to us as human beings as food and shelter. Um, but I think there's a lot of shame around feeling lonely. And so, I would say, um, if there was one thing that I would ask people to do, is to, to take the risk to reach out and find a community. Uh, there's so many virtual communities now that are so accessible, including ours, little plug. Um, but I would say that don't ignore that. Don't think that that doesn't matter to your, that's part of your spiritual health, and it's absolutely essential. First, I'm gonna say, echo on research. Women um, are underrepresented in research, women veterans especially. So in VA, we actually have a women, women's health research network as well. Um, if I can have, if I can ask for one plug for folks, um, number one, for those who have thought like, you know, I, I walked into VA like 10 years ago and I'm like never going to use it again. That VA is not the same as this VA now. It's not even the same VA from like three years ago. Um, and so whatever those misconceptions are, please, if you've used it before, please try it again. If you haven't, I encourage you to please give us a try because we're not the same. Um, the Center for Women Veterans at VA is like your advocate for everything. So if you like get entangled in something you can't get through, please call us, um, 00w at va.gov. And um, just everything that these ladies have said, advocate for yourself. You always have that right. Don't ever forget that you matter, you, you are valued, and you are on this earth for, some, for a reason. So give importance and value to that. So find your voice. I would like to thank these four amazing women for being with us today. I think we brought a lot of different perspectives, and then, of course, we got to hear the DHA perspective as, as well to, to kick us off. But what's really exciting is this is just the first of a series that's so important. So um, thank you for letting me moderate. I appreciate it. And um, with that, I know we have one more amazing speaker who I think is also going to challenge you with something to do to make sure that you've got that health. Um, so thank you very much. Well, they're returning to their seats. And thank you all so very much. As I was preparing, um, I was still serving in 2017. I was down at Fort Rucker, now Fort Novacell, Alabama. I had run the Marine Corps Marathon up here in Washington, DC, under four hours. Pretty damn proud of myself. <laughs> the reason I tell you that is to set the conditions. I didn't feel right. I was out trying to run my two miles, getting ready for my last physical fitness test as a soldier. I couldn't run a half of a mile without having to stop and catch my breath. I'd served in Iraq, I'd been around burn pits, but I had never had this happen in the six plus years since I'd been no longer deployed. So I went to the doctor, something's wrong. And I got the lovely young male captain tap, pat my hand. You're getting older, ma'am. <laughs> I started having that horrible tick in my neck. <laughs> to punch him in the throat. I know I'm getting older, but you don't change from being able to run a sub four hour marathon to I can't run a half of a mile without feeling like I'm, I can't, like an asthma attack feeling. 
So because I was a clinician, I started doing my own research. I asked for some labs. I wrote 17 vials of blood was drawn, and we got these results. And he's like, well, you know, some of your liver enzymes are out of whack, and maybe that's because, you know, after you run a, a heart event, it takes a while for your body to get back. And OK, so we waited 30 days and redrew. They were still just as wacky as could be. Long story short, because of advocating for myself, I learned that what I had was, sadly, an autoimmune, primary biliary cholangitis. And as a nurse, I'd never heard of that. I had to go WebMD it and see what the hell is wrong with it. So that was the genesis of why I left the military is because that was actually limiting my ability to function and operate on a daily basis. Thank God the, the, the pills I take every morning and every night now slow down the process enough that I should ideally not need a liver transplant in my lifetime. But who knew? I was this healthy, fit woman, and all of these things, as we talk about, where, where I was at 25 is not where I will be at 65. And our lives change, and what we think we know academically about ourselves have to change over time. And so don't let a clinician just pat you on the back of the hand and tell you, well, you're getting older. No shit, I know that one. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, that's the army coming out of me. I kind of knew that was happening to me. Thank you so much. But our lives do change. Our health does change over time. And we are a sum total of our experiences lived. So please take care of yourself physically and mentally. And I also am a proud visitor on a more frequent basis than I ever want to be, though, at the VA. Not because I don't like the VA, but because my health conditions have changed to a degree where I am there a lot. Um, so without further ado, we will have our closing keynote. Brigadier General Deidre Tehan. she serves as the Director of the Defense Health Network Capital Region. She oversees the healthcare delivery across 34 medical facilities with more than 12,000 staff members. She serves active duty members, their families, and eligible TRICARE beneficiaries. Mm -hmm. General Tehan has spent her career focused on improving the delivery of healthcare, holistic health, and readiness. Ma'am, please okay. join me on this. Stage. Well, good evening, everybody. If I summarize what she said just a minute and just make it simpler, if you need health care in the D.C. area, I'm the one that needs to help you if you can have a problem. <laughs> right? D.C., Maryland, Virginia, um, if, if you are getting your care from the military health care system, I look forward to partnering with you on your journey to health. And we are doing everything we can to make it easier for you to access our system so that when you need us, we are there. That is our goal. And I'm really excited to be here um, to kind of close um, this first session up in this series to really ask you and give you a charge about what you're going to do next with this information. Because you can come and read books, you can watch TED Talks, you can listen to the amazing panel that was just up here, but if tomorrow you don't do anything different, it really isn't going to change your risk for heart disease. And what I'd like to do as we close is ask you to think of the one thing you're willing to do starting tomorrow. And I want it to be small. And I want you to think about it as the next thing you're willing to do to create a new habit. Most of what we do every day is based on habits we create. And habits take four to six weeks to um, kind of get ingrained in your system. So I want you to just pick one thing. And there's a caveat to this. I don't want you to talk about something you want to give up. This is not about willpower. Willpower is a limited resource. I, I don't want you to think about what you don't want to do. I want you to think something that you want to do. And it's really important from a mental health perspective that we approach new habits, and then over time, those new habits crowd out the bad habits. And you get after the bad habits by actually emplacing new habits. And it's much more psychologically better for your health. Because if you're at a, a, a birthday party, you should eat that cupcake. <laughs> right? It's socially appropriate to eat that cupcake. <laughs> and if you don't eat that cupcake, 
you're going to leave there, or you do eat that cupcake and you think it's about willpower, you're going to feel less of yourself because you ate that cupcake at a socially appropriate time. So this is not about what you don't want to do. I want this to be about what you want to do. And I am so glad the, uh, um, the panel talks so much about loneliness. The U.S. Surgeon General has posted in May um, that loneliness isn't a pandemic. Um, it is an epidemic in our country, and it kills. And loneliness actually is more dangerous than smoking. I think 15 cigarettes a day is equivalent of just some loneliness, right? Um, and so fighting loneliness is absolutely critical. The, the second longest study in the United States was started at Harvard University in the 1930s. And they looked at people that were getting into Harvard and life was going well. And then they went to inner city Boston and found people that life was not going well. And they've measured them since. And as someone that has studied sleep activity nutrition for a long time, I was hoping I could get up here and tell you that was the one, one of those was the predictor of long-term success and happiness. It's not. It's connectiveness. It's actually people that are together and have friendships, have the right tribe, have the people they can count on, actually is the most important thing to predict long-term health and, and success. So if this is the area that speaks to you, maybe you say, we're going to have dinner with family three times a week with no electronics <laughs> and be connected. If you have an adolescent teenage uh, uh, child at home, Yes, no, yes. The conversations can be very limited and not much connectiveness, right? How was your day? Fine. Well, do you know if you just go for a walk after dinner with that same teenager, while you're walking, your mind opens up and they start sharing their day without uh, much resistance, where at dinner it might be harder to have that conversation? I actually tried this on my husband. It's my favorite time of the day. We go out on a walk after dinner, and the conversation is so much stronger, so much richer than any other part of the day. It's my favorite part of the day. What are you willing to do that is going to do that? And maybe it's just a phone call to family members one time a week for 15 minutes that you haven't been doing. But if you want to fight loneliness, what's that first step? And it, it can be small. Let's talk sleep. The numbers there don't lie. Sleep is a silent killer because we don't get enough of it as a country. And you might say, I don't have time for seven hours or eight hours of sleep a night. What about 15 more minutes? What about a nap on the weekends? What about giving you the grace that when you sleep in on Saturday and Sunday, it's okay to do and actually beneficial because you can be either paying off your sleep debt or banking sleep for the next week, but a little extra sleep on the weekend goes a long way. Treat yourself to some sleep. Or if you can't find that time, maybe it's the no caffeine six hours prior to bed or no technology two hours prior to bed. Or if you just can't put down the phone before bed, blue wave blockers the last two hours before bed so that you can get the blue wave out of your system so you can get to deep sleep quicker. Whatever it is on sleep, there's something small you can do tomorrow that would make a huge difference. We all know exercise is the magic pill. It fights every disease from depression and anxiety to cardiovascular disease. But it does not have to be that you're creating yourself as an Olympic triathlete. It really can be parking about 10 minutes further and walking into work. It could be taking 10 minutes of your lunch break and walking. It could be taking an extra 2,000 steps a day because just 2,000 steps a day decrease your risk of death by 8 to 11%. You don't have to hit 10,000. I would love for you to hit 10,000. That used to be just a magical number that came out of Japan from a marketing gimmick. But they've actually, since then, have proven that that actually is a pretty good number to reach on a daily basis. But you don't have to get there overnight. 2,000 is better than zero. And making that small change makes a big difference. The food you eat is important for both your heart and your brain. Um, and food you eat uh, is very critical. But again, this is where we don't do a good job as society because we think about the folks' food we don't want to eat. I want you to talk about what you want to eat. 
If you make half your plate fruits and vegetables and you eat that first, you naturally crowd out all the other food that you might want to not eat, but you do it without the psychological harm by saying you don't want to eat it. Just make your fruit and salad first. Eat your salad first. You'll eat less of the other stuff naturally, and it won't be psychologically damaging on your diet. If you want to go for eight servings of fruits and vegetables a day, think about that. If my goal is eight is great, I'm going to eat eight servings of fruits and vegetables a day. If you get to six, are you upset with yourself? No, you're still excited you got to six, right? That's more than you had the day before, right? And what's interesting is when they put a diet up like this against the American Heart Association diet, where you have to have tons of math and you have to keep spreadsheets and you have to talk everything, and then we just told people eat half your plate fruits and vegetables a day, same amount of weight loss without a lot of stress. Right? So what do you want to do in this space, and what do you want to do first? And the reality is it doesn't have to be complicated, because we will confuse you in the literature about what you're supposed to eat today versus tomorrow. <laughs> right? and, um, and the reality is don't overeat. Eat mostly fruits and vegetables and go for that first. And wine at five has been shown to help you live to 100, right? So wine at five is a good thing. We can do these things, right? This is easy to do. And we also talked about the importance of mindfulness and quieting the mind and finding time just to be present, knowing what your body's thinking, what you're feeling, how you're feeling, and giving yourself just to be in the moment. Mindfulness is critical and can be as simple as practicing mindfulness at a red light in DC and just breathing in and out instead of getting mad at the traffic. Using that as a time to prepare yourself to close out the day from work so when you can go home, you can be present with those you love. We were just at Harvard a couple weeks ago for a course and the gentleman teaching said, what is the definition of success? It's in the morning I get up and I'm excited to go to work. And at the end of the day, I'm excited to go home. Success is I'm happy to be where I'm at. However, if you're taking work home with you to, uh, to your house, are you really present? And practicing mindfulness beforehand can really make a huge difference. The other way you can practice mindfulness is your snacking. I'm really bad at snacking at the end of the day. Not good at all. I can eat a lot of snacks. The day's been stressful, I'm doing it. Do you know just eating your snacks with your non-dominant hand actually decreases how much you eat? Just breaking up that habit a little bit matters. <laughs> Easy one, right? Easy first step, right? Eat with your non-dominant hand. Or give yourself that bowl of chips you want, but you actually put it in a bowl, then you put the bag away, and then you walk in. That extra 10 feet decreases how many times you're gonna go refill that bowl. Right? So mindful eating and thinking about enjoying it and being present. And believe it or not, no technology why you eat is a simple first step because when you're engaged in watching the husky dog go woo, 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 and, and an hour later, you could have been eating the whole time and not realize it. Right? And so being mindful when you eat can be a huge thing. So I have a couple closing thoughts for you guys. And this is a true story. And I have people in the room that have actually read the letter that is not just me. You've seen this letter. We were at Fort Campbell, Kentucky, and there was a soldier being kicked out of the Army for being on the Army Body Composition Program. And we rolled out at the time Performance Triad, now the Army's Holistic Health and Fitness Program. And we were making it fun, and we were talking about how small changes make a big difference. He wrote a six-page handwritten note to the Surgeon General about his journey. And in the first page is why the army body composition rules are bad. All right, so let's ignore that. But then he said, you said small changes can make a big difference, and I would start that journey. So he thought maybe, just maybe, I shouldn't go to Burger King every day and have a double cheeseburger with bacon, large fry, large soda. But if I wasn't supposed to eat it, why is it on every military installation? <laughs> and his first step was a single cheeseburger, no bacon, medium fry, medium soda. That was his diet, his first step. Then he went from soda to Gatorade, which probably didn't help him at all because it was full Gatorade. <laughs> and then he went Gatorade to water. And over the next six um, pages, he talked about the small changes he made. And by the time he wrote the letter, he had lost 35 of the 40 pounds. My job was to call him and find out what he needed to do to get the last five pounds. And by the time I called him, he had lost the last five pounds. And he, he lost all 40 pounds by making one small change at a time. 
And the reason I tell this story is no dietitian would tell you to keep going to Burger King. The point here is what are you willing to do? It doesn't matter what that is. If it's better to invest in yourself tomorrow than you were investing in yourself today, whatever that step is, take that step, make it your new habit, and then add a new habit afterwards. And it's your journey. Just start the journey. I ask you guys to please start the journey by taking the first step, no matter how small it is. And I hope I gave you a lot of things to think about about what that first step could be. What will your last 10 years look like? Will you be quick enough for a game of tag with your grandchild? Strong enough to embrace every moment. Will you grow old with vitality? Or get old with disease? It's time to decide. So as I close this up, I, I, I was asked to spend about 10 minutes. I want to close with this picture. This is um, my retirement homes in Hawaii. I am looking forward to the time when I can retire in Hawaii. And this is the stairway to heaven in Hawaii. And you only can get that beautiful view one step at a time. But you have to start the journey to get to the view. And I hope today, from this amazing panel, our opening keynote, and something we've said today, encourages you to invest in your own health and well-being a little bit more tomorrow than you did yesterday. And all that matters is that you take that first step, and then it's what you're willing to do. It shouldn't be anyone else's voice. It's your own voice on what that is. And to me, the amazing part is it can be really anything. It can be whatever that first step is. And uh, um, hopefully something triggered something today that you're willing to vote for yourself a little bit more tomorrow. Thank you all so much. Wow. I want you to once again, please, show your love to our speakers and our panelists. Thank you. And again, we can never do these things alone. We have got to have the sponsorship and support. Those tables are out there. And by the way, there is wine being served <laughs> out there. When you go see those tables, get a glass of whatever your beverage of choice is and come visit all of the tables that are out there. But before we get there, I want to thank again our sponsors, TriWest. Thank you so very much. OptumServe, WPS Health Solutions, AARP. Maximus, Humana, Leonardo DRS. And I also now would love to bring up to the stage as we're gonna launch into our pre-reception warm-up, if you will, with Valerie Acosta with Community Building Artworks and Mallory Lass from the Cohen Clinic. If you two will come on up and warm it up and when they are done, we are gonna head out to the tables and enjoy something that's, what, what is it, wine at five? Wine at five. There we go, <laughs> thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Valerie Acosta Gonzalez. I'm here with Community Building Artworks. Um, where is the clicker? Okay. Um, I am an Air Force veteran. I retired about two years ago after serving 20 years in the Air Force as a Russian linguist. And when I. <gasps> yeah! You gotta talk after. <laughs> in Russian. <laughs> Um, after living that life, um, community building artwork, Seema and Ashley were kind enough to give me a home because I decided that that was no longer the life for me and I am now a self-taught artist teaching simple things to make sure that people know how to use resilience in art. We believe in the power of art and we believe that art can save lives. So what I am here um, today to do is teach you how we do it. 
So we are going to do that. And I'm so happy that I am following uh, small habits because I'm going to teach you about a small habit that you can start doing today. And we're going to start doing it in this room to make sure that you can get on a new track, right? We're going to do that through mandalas and gratitude. And the reason that I choose mandalas is because they are a spiritual symbol. Um, it represents the universe, it represents connection, it can be a journey, it represents impermanence. It comes from the Sanskrit word meaning circle, as a representation of how it can encompass your whole life. And it's used in different uh, practices like yoga or teaching mindfulness in order to put the mind at a place where we can shut down the rational part of our thinking brain enough to practice the things that are going to give us positive emotion. Now, I'm going to talk about gratitude, and I feel like I'm preaching to the choir here, because a lot of you probably know this a lot better than I do, but as a master resilience trainer in the Air Force, it was my job to teach the young airmen how to use gratitude as part of their resilience practice. And that comes from the theory of well-being developed by Dr. Martin Seligman at the University of Pennsylvania. I'm not going to go through the whole PERMA, but we are going to focus on the P in PERMA, and that is positive emotions. Uh, Dr. Brene Brown actually refers to this a lot in most of her talks, and she researches the relationship between joy and gratitude. And what she has found is that when you practice gratitude, you are more willing to actually feel joy. Now, cultivating a gratitude practice is basically teaching ourselves how to feel positive emotions, right? Like our brains are hardwired to notice the negative stimuli first because that's what keeps us alive, right? We used to run away from lions and now we run away from public speaking. Um, <laughs> I'm just gonna put it out there. I feel a lot safer now because my heart rate over there was like 150. So if I pass out, I've taken 10 milligrams of propanol in the last hour. But I so many physicians here, excellent. Um, but <laughs> that whole thing being aside, uh, we have to train our brains to actually feel positive emotion. It's a lot easier for us to notice the negative things during the day than it is to notice the positive things. And a way that we can switch that is by actually making a practice of reciting gratitude. The single best predictor of well-being, according to Kaufman, in life is gratitude. And positive emotions, not only gratitude, but like things like awe or happiness or joy, things that you can share with others and things that you can teach yourself how to notice. Because you do feel them, you just don't notice when you feel them. So positive emotions, of course, you know this. Instead of expecting the worst all the time, we can teach ourselves how to hope for the best. Instead of seeing the downside, we can learn how to see the upside of things. And it can also help us seize opportunities. Right? So there's, I want to also make a point that there is a difference between saying thank you and practicing gratitude, right? especially in our community that we are in. How many emails you sent today? 15 at least. And at the end, right next to your signature block, it already said thank you because it's pre-typed in there. All right, so practicing gratitude is something that you have to be willing to do. And we're going to do that by establishing gratitude practice. And the important thing about a gratitude practice is that you need to focus on small things. So right now, I want you to think in the last five hours, what two things can you be grateful for? And I highly suggest that you think of something small. And I'm going to give you mine. On the way here, I remember to bring my umbrella. I am very, <laughs> very grateful for that because otherwise this hair would be like up here. Right? On the way here, I actually had time to eat lunch. I had left my art class at George Mason University, and I had time to stop by, get lunch, and eat it on the way here, but I ate lunch today. I am very grateful for that. So when you start a gratitude practice, focus on the small things, focus on the immediate moment, and be consistent with it. Choose what works for you. It can be daily, it can be weekly, I don't suggest monthly, maybe twice a week, uh, but be consistent with it because the point is to get yourself in the habit to where it becomes almost unnoticeable for you to say, let me practice gratitude. Like I don't have to tell myself anymore, let me make time today to practice gratitude. My brain, because I have been doing this for about five years now, my brain already tells me, you can be grateful for that today. 
Like, I had to start in a very difficult way. I actually forced myself to write in my journal three times a day, what am I grateful for right now? What am I grateful for right now? But that became very natural to my brain. So I'm very thankful for that. And also make it tangible. And what I mean by that is that, yes, we are happy and grateful that we are alive. We are happy and grateful that we woke up today. But sometimes when you are starting a practice, when you want to establish that habit, it is easier if you focus on the small things. I am grateful for the bag of Funyuns that I snuck in in my car before I had to pick my kids up because I did not have to share my Funyuns with them. <laughs> like, that is tangible. That is tangible gratitude. So do that. Choose that for yourself, okay? Um, we are going to be practicing actually drawing mandalas and practice gratitude outside in the gallery. We have all the materials for you. We have paper, we have pens, we have colorful papers. So please, when we're done here, join us outside and I will guide you how to make some beautiful mandalas. Thank you so much for your attention. Hello everybody, my name is Mallory Lass. I'm a proud Air Force veteran and I'm so excited to be here with you all today, especially after such an incredible event so far. So thank you so much for joining us. I'm here today to talk to you a little bit about the Stephen A. Cohen Military Family Clinic at Easter Seals. I like to joke we have a long name because we do a lot. And I'm gonna try my best to summarize that as quick as possible. Our key initiative is to make mental health accessible for all and remove barriers to care. We are a nonprofit clinic that serves service members, um, public health service, veterans, regardless of their discharge status, and family as defined by that service member. So think about those extended family members. I think of my cousin. She moved out to San Antonio with me at my first duty station, and she would have been eligible for care. So it's truly, who do you define as family? We're an incredible partner of the Cohen Veterans Network, which has 25 clinics across the entire United States, and we're growing every day, every year. We're only six years old. Um, and we're also partnered with Easter Seals locally. Um, today, I brought some incredible stress kits. So let me ask a quick question. How many people here have a first aid kit at home? Everybody. But as we were talking about today, mental health is health, and we often forget about that. So we, with our partners at Navy Federal, were able to develop these incredible stress kits. And it teaches us to use the present moment, that gratitude Valerie just talked about, to bring us back into that present moment out of any type of negative headspace we're going to be in. So it has incredible um, tangible items that we can use in here to use our five senses. One of my favorite things, and I'm sorry not all of them have it, but we even got little pink warriors to remind <laughs> us of our ethos. Um, but lots of fun little activities and gifts in here, and I'm going to have these at our table outside where you can come learn more about all of the incredible services at the Cohen Clinic, as well as my incredible community partners, such as Community Building Artworks and everybody else in the room. So I do encourage you, please stop by. We're all here to advocate for you, to give you the resources you need to make those new habits, the change that we're talking about today. And just thank you so much for being here today, and I look forward to meeting you. Okay, so this ends the official part of the afternoon. We're going to open the doors. We encourage you, please. There's about 14 tables out there, including some lovely catered food and beverages. Enjoy yourselves. And uh, we're here to answer any questions. And again, to any of our folks in the front row, they're available for you to answer any questions. Thank you again, and have a good evening.